Yeah, thank you very much. Today, uh, Bernard is going to present a bit uh, on Lama um, and, and the future of uh, high performance computing, large data analysis, and uh, software for that. And I'm looking forward to this. But before we start, we have one guest, Deborah. Uh, she's been working at MPI CBG with Florian Jux Group, where they have these cool microscopes and everything. Um, and you're a research software person. And I'm trying to convince Deborah today that maybe uh, she could also have a look at our institute. So I'm very happy that you're here. And of course, we later uh, take some time. You can talk to the people, now you see them. But we'll make an introduction later on because now everybody's eagerly waiting for Bernhard. Well, hopefully. I have, yes, I have been nothing but yesterday in the car, I was doing 200 just to All get you to this. All you thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> That puts a lot of pressure on me now. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay, then I'll just take over. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to talk to you about Llama. So Llama is a software project that's out of the zoo that Alpaca kind of founded. So you heard of Alpaca every now and then. And Llama is kind of like a similar aspect. It's kind of part of this group of libraries that's supposed to, to be software infrastructure for various kinds of scientific high performance computing. Llama focuses on uh, memory layout optimization. It's by the way an acronym for low level X abstraction of memory access, if I recall correctly. It's always a bit, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, so you don't it, it has twice the same, the same letter. So you, so you gotta think. Um, anyway, so this talk uh, is composed of a few parts. Um, I never rehearsed the slides uh, before, so I don't know how long it takes, but like the first half will focus on what Llama as the library can do. And then there are three other parts and we can see how far we get and what's interesting. So uh, if you at some point say, God, it's so boring, like you can like wave your hand or whatever, then you can, and you won't can skip to something else. So. <laughs> I might consider it. <laughs> I might still show you to death with some C++ because I like it. Anyway, so um, so the first part, the first around 20 slides is Llama, and the rest is more about like memory mappings. We talk about like there will be some math. There will also be a lot of code. So something for everybody, I guess. Okay, good. First few slides, we will cover some some groundwork, and the first thing I would like to talk to you about is vectorization because it's uh, by now probably the most important thing for any, for any software to really achieve uh, like, like, like high amounts of, uh, of speed up and throughput without changing the algorithm in, in, in a way of like, like choosing a different method that's faster is a way of computing more in one go. And the way processors do that nowadays is by instead of, and let's see if my cursor works here. Yeah, you can see that, how oh, nice. So if you have a computation that, that involves areas of data, and this is usually what we have some, somewhere in our programming, like we want to compute something and not just single things, but usually in multiple things. So somewhere we have collections of, 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 of numbers of objects that we want to run calculations on. So if we have, a, in this case, like four areas, A, B, C, and D, and we want to like just sum up those, multiply something, we have some kind of index that accesses into those areas and we do this calculation. So what the processor does is it fetches an element from this B area and fetches an element from the C, it fetches an element from the D, does this multiply, does this edit, does this store of a single value back to memory. So now memories uh, these days and the way memory is accessed is usually in larger chunks. So like the CPU, it doesn't talk to the memory in just single pieces of elements, but in larger in larger uh, chunks of memory, which, which are called cache lines. And that's why it's beneficial to also put multiple elements at once and run computations. And this is what we can see here on the right. So we take at an index i, um, just eight elements all together. So that means we fetch eight b's, eight c's, and eight d's, and we run those computations, all the eight elements at the same time. And this will, 
take up like the exact amount of CPU cycles used for the calculation. So every time we do calculations on single elements, we're actually wasting a lot of capability of our CPUs. So that's important to keep in mind. Okay, uh, I think that's a summary again. Um, in the context of vectorization, we pretty often also hear this acronym SIMD, which uh, stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, because the processor uses the same instruction, like a very similar instruction, to compute something on a single element, and also when it computes something on multiple elements. It does the same addition, the same multiplication, but it does it on eight pieces instead of one, for example. And that takes the same amount of time. And this is also called data parallelism. So you parallelize on the, on the input data you have. So that improves a lot the um, CPU single core performance. So we're not talking about parallelizing across multiple threads going to GPUs, but just like what a single core of your CPU can do to just run your code more efficiently and then have more throughput. And I'm already getting corrected here. Thank you, Sergey. Technically not the same as clock speed slows down to vectorize pieces. So um, <laughs> let's, let's address that. And, and, and Sergey is now. already thrown out of the disk. <laughs> So, so what Sergey mentioned is that it's not technically correct because for some instructions the CPU slows down. And I hope I could spare you the technical details, but there are certain subgroups of vector instruction sets that really clock down the CPU because they produce too much heat inside the chip. And that's specifically instructions of I think AVX512. And I think there's also a slight slowdown for certain instructions in AVX2. Is that correct? Sergey is not talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So how, how can we how can we vectorize? And quite often we still need to do that manually. And manually means that in our program we need to explicitly say whenever we access a variable, don't just take one of those, but like fetch eight of those at the same time. So we need to express this in code. And this is a uh, very unmaintainable and very annoying to program this way. Uh, so that's why compilers these days are trying really, really hard to understand the memory access patterns in your program so that they see that you access like inside a loop, you access the i filament and the i, it, it just like goes nicely from one, two, three, four, and there are no conditions inside or no like weird data dependencies. So it tries to come up with a way of doing this automatically. But compilers can only do this if the memory access pattern, so the way you, you, you grab the pieces, uh, your elements out of the memory, if this is done in a nice way and in a way that the compiler can understand. And there are a lot more conditions for compilers to be able to vectorize. And that's also kind of the theme of the talk. Now we will focus on memory access pattern. We'll, we will look into how we can tell the compiler how to how the memory is accessed, how can we play maybe with the style that we access memory. And that will hopefully lead the compiler to bake better optimizations. So a short word on GPUs. GPUs work in a way they have a, a lot of threads, like really thousands of threads. And those threads very often are grouped together in like 32 or 64 threads. So that's a common number for NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. So they are grouped together. And also those, those bunch of threads, it's sometimes called a warp or a wavefront, the access memory at the same time. So you have 32 threads that just go to memory and each one accesses one element um, of data from the memory. And if this access is really done in a favorable way so that each thread, let's say, just takes a single float value out of memory, the next thread accesses the next float value in memory. If all threads access the memory this way, then this access is called uh, coalescing and it's going to be fast. So that's the gist here. So also for GPUs, it matters that we access memory in a predictable and a, in a coherent way. Good. OK, there are various kinds of, of memory layouts. And there are two, three fundamental ones that I'd like to talk to you today. So, so briefly, we have a structure on the side. And um, this presentation will contain a lot of C++ code. So we are always seeing C++ code here. So we have a structure that's composed of two values. It's a float x, it's a float y. Now we have an area of those. And the way the language rules are to put this into memory is that it will put a, a value, a float value for x, a float value of y, and then it will start with the next struct. So there will be another x, another y, another x, another y. This is how the rules of the language, this is not something the compiler can choose. This is really something that the C++ standard or before C++, the C standard demands of the program. 
So this is how the memory layout is going to look like. And this layout is called an array of structs. Why? Because we have a structure and we build an array out of it. Pretty, pretty obvious. Okay, then we can reverse this by moving the area uh, extent into the struct itself. So this layout is called a struct of arrays because now we have a single struct and each like domain element I'll have you like, like the, the X coordinates, for example, they are laid out contiguously as arrays. So here I have uh, eight X values, uh, eight Y values, and those will be put into memory in another way. And you can see that this is kind of the transposed layout of the previous one. So in this case, now we have all the X values side by side. So why is this nice? Because if you have computations that run on positions and maybe just compute something on the X value or on the Y value, now we can pull up eight of those X values at the same time from memory. So this is a layout where compilers can do better optimizations than, than with the previous one. And there's also a mixture of that that's called array of struct of array, or some people call it blocking. And that's a mixture. So we have arrays inside the struct and arrays outside of the struct. And um, there are various kinds of trade-offs we are making here. Um, because we could argue, why do we need that one? Because the previous one, the struct of arrays also vectorizes nicely. And the reason is uh, CPUs are complex these days. So we try to, to, to build a favorable memory layout, but also CPUs have, have caches and caches means whenever I do a memory access, the CPU will pull a chunk of memory and keep it in the CPU cache. So we're going, so when we are going to touch the piece of memory again, it's, it's accessible much, much faster. So if I now spread out my struct into like longish arrays, and now I want to access X, like just of one position, I want to access X and Y. Now those, this X and this Y are further apart from each other in memory. So it's quite likely that the CPU is going to do two fetches of two cache lines when I just talk to a single position. Whereas if I had an array of struct and I would take a single positions, those are next to each other and it's likely to go, likely to go into one cache line. So there's a trade-off that we are making here. The struct of arrays, is, it vectorizes really nicely, but it spreads out the data. And the area of struct, it keeps the data of single pieces together, but this is very bad for vectorization, for example. So that's why this uh, array of struct of array uh, layout exists, so we can make a trade-off uh, trade between those, those methods. There's also a fourth aspect, um, that's padding, because sometimes we would like some empty space in our structs. So, so why would we want to do that? It's just uh, wasteful to some degree. Um, yes and no, because um, there are certain other effects, uh, especially that happen when you access data concurrently. So you have like multiple cores or multiple threads, and they are talking to memory locations that are either the same or very close to each other. So it can be problematic if, let's say, like one core writes data to some bytes in memory, and another core starts reading from just a few bytes off of that. And so the most problematic case is when you talk to the same cache line. And something called false sharing of course. And I don't bore you with the technical detail, but the CPUs have troubles keeping the data in their caches if, if other cores talk to very, very close memory locations. So that's why sometimes we try to spread data out a little bit so the CPUs cores can access them more independently. So that's the, the gist with the, the takeaway from here. <coughs> so, these are nice memory layouts. Um, so, but so far we, did, we didn't have a problem yet. So what's, what's the issue? We can just pick a memory layout that's nice and, and, and that's good. So the problem we hear is that the way data is uh, represented in the program and the way data access is represented in a program depends on how we specify this, this data layout. So if we choose to define our data and I have two structs here. So the first one is an, uh, array of structs and the second one is a struct of arrays. Depending on how we describe this data structure to the program, the, the way we'll access it in our code will change. And we can see that below, so when we access uh, this array P, if the array uh, extend is outside, is, is on, on the struct itself, I can just write, and maybe I really use the mouse cursor here. I can write P at, at, the, at the position I and then access this X value. But if the area is inside, 
this way changes. And this looks like a subtle change. But if I have a more complex data structure, this can vary a lot. And we can also see that when, let's say, I want to pass a single particle, a single P that's going to be a particle, to a function, if I want to pass a single particle, I can now just request the i particle. Whereas when I have the, the struct of arrays, there is no single particle together in memory. So I either like make a second struct particle, I gather that together and I pass it to the function, or I just need to pass all the data components individually. And, and this is also annoying because this means every time I want to change my memory layout, I need to also change all the access patterns throughout the entire program. Now it turns out that different hardware needs different memory layouts to perform well. Like we want to pick a different layout for GPUs, for CPUs, maybe like for smaller CPUs and CPUs with many cores, or maybe for, I don't know, CPUs on your mobile phone, for example. So it would be really, really great if we could separate the way the memory is laid out from the way it's presented to the program. So you can write your program and your, 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 your code once, and like some kind of interface that you program against the fit, and the way it's represented in, in the back, it's going to be flexible. Question? Yeah, one, of, one thing you said in the beginning was that there are standards of how you actually define data structures within the language so that the, that the uh, language basically sets a standard on how to treat a data structure, that it, for example, might not have padding or something like that, or that it is continuous in memory or anything. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that actually be a problem now that you change that kind of understanding because people have been maybe writing C++ for 10 years and then they kind of assume these standards and now you're changing them. What is your... So, so the... The observation was, if the C++ standard tells exactly how a struct is going to look like, how can we change this? And the answer is, we cannot change that. So if a user writes a struct and defines its data members, we cannot bend or break the rules of the language on how this is going to put, be put into memory. But you can always move away from structs and manage the memory yourself. Like, I can just allocate a buffer of bytes and then myself say like, where are the, where do I put my floats, my doubles, my, my, my little pieces? So now I'm going to do a lot of manual labor to achieve this because it's outside the scope of what the language gives me for structs. Okay. And, and how severe is this problem? Is it that it's like, if you can separate memory layout from the access that you can say this is possible or not possible in, on different hardware, or is it a certain X speed up that you would get? So um, it's not about uh, possibility or correctness of the program. So either data layout will run because it, because it, it follows the rule of the language. You have your struct, you have your data accesses. So your program is going to run and it will complete and will probably give you the right results. Um, but there is a severe slowdown potentially. And there's a theoretical number you can say, let's say like your, your CPU has uh, vector instructions and vector registers that can fit eight floats instead of one. So there is a potential factor of eight that you could get. get. If you make, like if, if your program can fill up this, this, this arithmetic power that the CPU has, like uh, the, the way you fetch memory, the way your data is spread out into memory, it's in a favorable element, uh, in a favorable way, so you can feed the CPU fast enough. So that could potentially get you 8x. Practically, I have an example later uh, where I can show you that we got 3x. So we are, we are not talking about 50x or something, so that's not possible without changing fundamentally how your program and the algorithm works. But like realistically, we are somewhere around like two, three, four, five x. Theoretically, maximum eight, maybe. If you have new vector instructions, you can even get sixteen. Okay. So in this order of magnitude. Good. So that's it for the introduction. We're finally there. Hello, welcome to my talk. This is going to be about Llama. Um, Llama is a a software library, um, and it's supposed to be a low-level abstraction of memory access. And the idea, as I outlined already, is to split the algorithmic view of data. So when I write my program, the way my program looks at a data structure, it's going to split that off from how the data is mapped to memory. So I can choose different memory layouts, like at compile time, and 
that will not change the code I've, I've written against the interface of the data structure. So I don't need to like change my algorithms, um, um, but I can I can switch out the way the, the data is mapped to memory. Lama is header only, it's portable, it's C17, it supports CUDA 11 and, and, and upwards. So that's just some side notes. It's designed to integrate with Alpaca, which is another library people gave talks on, I think. It's orthogonal to Alpaca, so you can use it without Alpaca, but it's supposed to, to nicely work together with Alpaca. And it currently still relies on the compiler's auto vectorizer. So there is no explicit vectorization built into it yet. I would like to look into that, but there is still a lot of time in my PhD. So, and then there is a lot of- Ah, uh, that's nice when they say it in the beginning. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. We have it recorded, so you can play it to me. <laughs> okay, I, I remind you of that one. <laughs> I'm going to show you an example, and that's an example about a, an end body simulation, because uh, there you can see that quite nicely. And just as a very brief introduction, what the code does is it runs for n time steps, and it takes, we have a buffer of particles that are going to be simulated. So for each P1, for each particle P1 in, in, the, in that set of particles, I take another particle P2. So basically, I'm, I'm forming pairs of all the particles. And I will then update the velocity of P1 based on the influence of the other particle at that time step T. So we're going to have like two nested loops and um, the inner loop, the particle of the inner loop is going to be updated by all the other particles. And then that's the update step. And afterwards for each particle in the set, we update the position depending on its velocity. So that's like those two steps. And I'm going to show you three pieces of code. And I'm moving here to Compiler Explorer. Can you see that? The font it's too small, small maybe? So can the, can the online participants see this? Uh, if you can increase the font a little bit, it would be nice. So 18, I'll also put 18 here. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, yeah that's better. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, great. It's perfect. And this tool is amazing. My mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> it has two windows separate exactly. exactly next to each other. And it shows assembly in rainbow colors. Wow, wow. rainbow. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for, for those who didn't get the joke, this is uh, Compiler Explorer, which is a, a tool that was built a few years ago by, by a person called Matt Gottbold. That's why the URL is called gottbold.org. What it does is it can take a piece of code, it will compile it, and it will show you the assembly the program compiles to. And then you can choose and know somebody an awful lot of compilers. So those are all Q++ compilers that you can choose from. And you can specify like command line options, you can add libraries to it, and I think it also supports a bunch of other languages that you can look into. So basically a way of like playing like very tightly, very intimidatedly with your with your compiler, typically. Okay, anyway, so the code. Uh, I'm going to de define a struct vec, and I'm going to use uh, fp here, that's an alias for float, so there's going to be a floating point here. So I'm going to use a, flag, a, a vector of, of free floats x, y, and c. Then I define a bunch of operators, not so much interesting, but here I have the data structure. So I'm going to have a particle that has a position, and this position is basically a vec, so that will be uh, that will have x, y, and c as a, as a float. I define a velocity that's also a vector so that also has x, y, and c. And then I define another float mass. Good, that's the data structure. That's how we would write that down naively, maybe or in, in in a similar way. Okay. Now I want to have a bunch of them, and I'm in C plus plus, so I will create a vector of those particles. And I have a certain size of my problem. Doesn't matter what it is. It's an integer. It's it's a larger integer, it's a few thousand. So we have a few thousand particles here. And I'm going to initialize that using some random numbers. And I want, I would like you to pay attention to the data axis that we, that we write here. So what we write is we go over each particle and then we explicitly write that P dot position. So that's where we tell the compiler on this particle P, I want you to navigate on where the position is stored. And then I want you to navigate where the X value is stored. 
And this is supported by the programming language itself. So obviously we know that this is how we, how we talk to data. But I want to raise this awareness that we actually describe here a way that the compiler navigates into memory and how it computes an offset of a, me like a memory address on where it starts fetching a float value from, and then later like store a float value too. So this is how we express it normally in our C++ code. So this code is an implementation uh, of an um, array of struct layout. And we can see that because here we have a vector of structs, it doesn't need to be an area specifically, but those particles will be laid out consecutively in memory. So it's like, like it would be an array of those particles. So in our simulation, we can then run over like all the particles in two nested loops. We can do that here. Like we count from I to the problem size and then from J to the problem size. And then we take the J from the I particle and then we can compute the interaction between those two. And here we just run some calculations. So we take uh, one particle, the one that we're going to update, we take another particle, that's the one that does the influence on the other particle. And then here is just a bunch of computation. So what the compiler generates from here, and we can see this on the right here, are a lot of instructions. And I'm not going to bore you a lot with details, but you can see here when I move over the assembly, it also shows me the lines of code on the right that produce this kind of assembly. Oh, I love this. We can, we can see instructions here like V add SS, for example. So what does that mean very quickly? So V stands for vector. So wow, we have vector instruction. That's really cool. It turns out that many vector instructions, uh, there are versions that just work on single elements. And we can see this here. And I think it's this, the first S here that we have here. And that stands for scalar. So this is a vector S, a scalar. And the second S stands for single precision. So that is an instruction that takes a single precision floating point. It's going to do an add. And it's going to do an add on a scalar value and not on a vector. So that's the most important takeaway here is if you look at this and we, we see SS on a lot of those vector instructions, this is scalar code. So this is code that just takes one float of the memory, runs computation on one float. Okay, cool. So let's go back. Let's take another example. See if I need to change the font size a second time. I do. You young people have it so good. We had to do this with punch cards back in. <laughs> My professor told me this. <laughs> yeah, what's horrible? What's horrible? Oh, yeah, really? That we also good? didn't have a McDonald's <laughs> the gyms, or I don't know what. <laughs> or PlayStation. Everything I don't know. was black and white back then, not even <laughs> rainbow exactly. colors. People didn't even have color. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's say I want to write this program in a, in a, in a struct of arrays way. So I want to split off the X, the Y of the positions. I want to split off the mass, and I want this to be individual arrays. So if I'm going to do this manually, it could look like this. And you can already see, like, this kind of blows up the program a little bit. Uh, it also feels a bit weird, because now we don't have a particle anymore, but we have this vector of, of, of X positions, this vector of Y positions, this vector of masses. So it kind of feels, feels weird, maybe. The way we're going to access this is um, here now it's kind of reversed. So I still have the area index here. I'm talking to the I thing, but now I need to specify okay, which area you're going to talk to. So here we, we have already observed that this changed the, 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 the way we, we talk to those, the, those data structures in our programs. And if I then call update here, I'm going to make a line break here, I can now not pass like a single area of particles in, because now I need to pass in all those individual areas. In theory, I could just pack all the vectors together in one struct to so have an easier life of passing them around in, in, in my program. But the gist is that here we have multiple areas that we are, that we are talking to in our, in our program. And this becomes even more evident if we look at the call to update here. Now we have like a lots, of, lots of parameters for the various kind of, of, of areas we have. And then we can, again, go over all the particles in two nested loops. But then when we want to compute the interaction between two of those particles, I can no longer like, pull a single particle here and a single particle here out of memory and call a function giving it two particles. Because two particles don't exist anymore. I spread this data out of memory. And this looks ugly. And it's annoying to program. 
Because here you can see like now the PP interaction, which is the particle particle interaction function, not takes two particles, but just a bunch of values. And it's might even, it might even be easy to confuse them up or pass the wrong values when I call this function. So, so this is nasty to program. But we might see the benefit here if you look here on the right side, that suddenly like all those instructions that previously were called SS, they're now called PS. And this P stands for packed. So that's a vector instruction that can work on a packed values, uh, on, on a pack of values. And that's now really, really nice because this means the CPU is going to work on an entire, like in this case, a uh, CMM register. And that when that register is, is pulled from memory, I can see it at the moment. It's, I think, one of those move instructions here. And it's going to move data from the memory into this register. It's going to move a pack of scalar value, a pack of single precision values into your register, and the computations later will be done on whole packs of data. And this is going to be fast. Okay, cool. But we've seen that now this changes the way we write our programs. So what if we had a library that could abstract this away? And this is what Lama tries to do. And this Can is I ask you a quick question about the yes, assembly? Please tell me. Um, so, in in the first example, the the instructions we're using, I think, still MMX registers, while the set MM registers are AVX registers, right? And they're also longer, yes. so they should be, uh, yeah, five twelve, right? Set MM ones. Uh, do you know if there is any if there is any performance impact if uh, AVX command operates on a MMX register? No, wait, did I say interesting that question. AVX command operates on a MMX register. So, a piece of background information: um, when new vector instruction sets got introduced, your CPU already had some existing instructions, and your CPU had existing registers. So, the way it usually worked is. Um, you took the existing register, you doubled up its size. So let's say you have a, a register and it's called XMM. So that's like the typical name for a vector register back when uh, like we had SSE instructions, for example. So when uh, AVX instructions came along, and AVX is for advanced vector extension, I think. And there was an instruction set that had wider vectors. The CPU vendors just took the XMM register, they doubled it up and called it YMM. But, when it, but this means like now I don't have a separate XMM and a separate YMM register. So those are actually the same register. But if I have XMM in my, in my assembly, it's going to just talk to one half of the register. So whether I have XMM or YMM here, if I do scalar operations, it makes no difference. Because I'm only talking to a single flow, then that's going to fit in the register no matter if I talk to the lower half or the full register. So the question now is, would it be a slowdown if I have an XMM register here instead of a YMM, although I just use a single value of the register? My answer is, I don't know. I would assume it doesn't make a difference because it's still doing the same amount of computation effort. It's still is an, a scalar instruction that works on a single flow. I think it shouldn't matter, but I don't know. Does that answer the question? Maybe the moves or something. Yes, thank you. I had troubles hitting the unmute button. <laughs> okay. Since Michael mentioned the move instructions, like, like up here we also have the move instruction. Also this move is a move S, so it's a scalar move. So we just transfer a single flow. The I CPU know. in the background will transfer the cache line, but I just throw everything away except for that one float value, and that will be put into XMM4. Whereas in the vectorized version, I see... I should see a move PS, so that's a packed move instruction. So that moves, and since it's going to CMM, it's going to move the entire size of the CMM register, and that should be, I think, eight or six, I think it's 16 floats. So that's going to move 16 floats into your CPU at once. Okay, let's look at the Llama version. So um, so finally, now we are actually here, you know, it's like, thank you for being here, that's a talk about Llama. So we're going to include the Llama header, and that might look weird to you on the first line because I'm just pulling in some random header from GitHub because it lives there. And that's the cool thing about Compiler Explorer. You can like, include things over HTTP. That's, it's, it's just awesome. So you can pull in a header from any GitHub repository. Good, so you have Llama here now. So what does that mean? 
Um, I have a bunch of variables that I talk to you later about. But Michael already mentioned that at some point, well, the C++ standards gives us restrictions on how structs can be laid out in memory. So if I want to play with this, I can no longer use structs. And that's exactly the problem. So we need a different way of describing our data structure. And the way we can do this, the way we can describe types to the compiler, and like ways types interact, is usually in C++ in like a very delicate subregion of the language that's called C++ templates and going one step further than C++ template meta programming. Because now we're using templates to do some kind of like programming or computation at compile time and we are manipulating type data. And that's actually an abuse of the language that someone found out in the early 2000s that you can do this. And this kind of sub-language inside of C++ is actually Turing complete and you can do a lot of stuff with this. And then the reality was that compilers absolutely couldn't handle that and compilers got a lot better with that. And I'll stop the history lesson here because it's very interesting, but it's not part of the talk here. So anyway, we're going to use templates. And the way we can do this is by, by using templates that Llama provides. And one of these templates is, is the DS template, and that's called a, date, a datum struct. So here Llama, uh, Llama gives me a, a tool to describe, I have a struct here. So this struct begins here and it ends here at the very bottom. So that's a struct of data. And inside this struct, I have data elements. And now inside of like compile time programming, I cannot just put names anywhere. I need to like live by the rules of the language. And if I'm doing template meter programming, I need to work with types. So I have no way of saying like, I have a data member and it's called position or it's called X or Y. So I need to come up with a different way. And one way we can do here is that we just define types that are standing or names for the things we're talking about. So I can define a type that I call position. I can define a type that I call X. And this type itself, it doesn't do anything. Like it doesn't even have any, any meaning or operations or data members, but I just uses it as a, as a name that lives inside the compiler that I can use to talk to, to various things or identify certain things. So I take, for example, this, this type X and I pass it here to this template datum element. And I take this X and I pass in a second data type, and that's again the, the float alias that, that we had in previous example. So in this way, I, I put together the information that there is something called X, and it's going to be a float. And I can make like group X, Y, and C that's going to be floats into a datum struct and call that a velocity. So Which you're, you you're putting here. in there structs. There's a reason for that, that you're doing structs there, and then they're basically empty. Because they're just names, aren't they? Yes, because essentially a type inside a compiler is a name, and then the compiler just during compilation aggregates more information to this name. Like in which places is it used? Like does it have functions, which data members, whatever. But fundamentally, a type is a name that lives inside the compiler. And inside C, we have a mechanism to do different things if we have different types. Like a simple example, if you have two functions, one takes an int and one takes a float. So the, the pure information that something is an int or a float, like can distinguish between two pieces of code. So that's like an example, like just like the name int and the name float, they refer, like I can use them to select between two pieces of code, for example. And one of the strange things is, is that, that the compose, or to me writing that, or having a look at it first, is that those components x, y, z live in the same namespace space tag. I think that's not necessarily needed. I mean, you're just doing this out of convenience, do you? So I could I could remove this namespace tag here, and that would be just work just fine. I would also need to remove those qualifiers here, and I can just use, let's say, like, like x directly, directly here, and move this okay. out of the namespace. So that would work. Whoops. Um, the problem is now I now have a, a struct X that will be defined globally in my entire program and I cannot name anything X again in my program. And maybe that's a bit too restrictive and that's why I keep them in like a little namespace so they can live their the quiet life here and they don't disturb the rest of the program too much. That's the reason why they're put in the namespace. Okay, so this is essentially just the struct that we would define otherwise. And here we have tags that identify the pieces of the struct. 
Okay, so that was that was weird, but but let's look at how the other part of the code looks like. And I need to allocate the piece of memory at some point, like like the data structure. So we had std vector at some point, or a bunch of std vectors uh, in the other example. In Llama, I also need a, a, a way to, 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 to define, like to allocate this data structure. I described how a single particle looks, looks like, but I also need a bit more information. Like I want to build an array out of those particles. I want Llama to reserve memory for that. And then we talk about all those memory mappings or, or whatever. So how do I specify those? And this is what I need to set up for Llama to work. And in Llama, I have something that I call the array domain. And this array domain, it's the part of my data structure that's like the repetition of something that's inside this array. And how many dimensions does it have? What are the sizes of, of these arrays? So you can think of like the definition we, we gave previously, this particle that sits inside an array. And then we're building like a one, two, three, whatever, like dimensional array out of this, out of this particle. So in my case, I have a one-dimensional array because I just pass one size to, to every domain, and that's the size of the problem. And now I need to have a mapping. And don't be too bothered by like, all these conditions because this is the mechanism that I can use later if I change the, the, the value of the variable mapping. It would just pick a different piece of code. And like one piece of code here is Llama mapping AOS, and that's array of structs. So this is how I tell Llama, I now want to do a memory mapping that resembles an array of structs. And I'm going to pass in the size of the, of the arrays, and I'm going to pass in the particle, like a single piece of the particle. And actually, we, we don't need an instance of this particle inside this mapping. But since this, because I'm creating a temporary, temporary variable here. Uh, okay, so here, those are those braces afterwards. So that just creates a single particle and passes it to the constructor of AOS. But it not only passes the value, it also passes the type information. So this is here a way of, of me transporting the type information of this particle, which was like this big datum start of datum elements. This is, my, this is the way that I pass this information to AOS. So AOS now knows the array domain and it knows this definition of particle that I will call the datum domain now. And depending on the value of mapping, I can choose an array of struct mapping, a struct of array, and something weird called a tree mapping. And I'm going to maybe talk about it later during the talk. But as you can see here, I can like switch this, this memory layout. Like I can pick this one here, I can pick the other one here. Anyway, it's going to be stored here in mapping. And then I can allocate the few in Llama. So and the few is the piece that I as a programmer then use and program against. It's my interface that I use to talk to the elements behind that live in memory. It's my interface that I will tell Llama, take the i particle, take the positions, take the, the values of x and, and so on. And we can see that here. And that might look uh, a bit weird after what we've seen before. Uh, one, one question, can I do this allocation once? So this allocation one, once per a whole program, once yes. this is then filled, or do I, can I do this again? Some How this allocation, later? you can make as many pieces as, as you want. So this and it won't won't uh, point to the same memory then? No, it doesn't keep state in any way okay, in, behind, so it's... behind your back. Okay. So this alloc view, it returns some something that I call particles here. So this is going to be a view that, that allows me to access my particles. I can just call another alloc and like make a second view or whatever. I can call this as many times as I want. So you can think of this as that's my std vector of my particles. And I can make as many of those as I want in my program. Seems to take quite some time when you do that. Yes. So whenever I change the code here, it's going to recompile. And it recompiles in the cloud. And there are virtual machines. And it's not the fastest fastest machines available. But to be honest, like there's a lot of like compile time magic going on. And it really takes a bit of time to compile. Yeah. That's, that's a valid observation. So the way I'm going to access data is, is I, okay, I need to explain that as well. So we only, 
we not only want to have uh, a bunch of particles, but sometimes we just want to have like a single particle somewhere because we want to have like a single particle, fill it up with data, and then we move it into the larger collection of particles. So Lama has a second way of just getting a single thing, and that's called alloc virtual datum stack. And that's a complicated name, and I'm going to tell you later about this one. But anyway, it gives me a single particle. So this is not a single thing that's like just like, like, like a struct that, that, that lives here as a struct. So this is going to do some magic in the background. But we don't need to care how this exactly works. We only need to care that it behaves like a particle and that I can deal with it in a way as, as I can deal with particles. And the way I access it is now I need to reuse those, those, those names I had previously, those, those tags we defined. So I can go to this temp here, which is just my temporary particle. And I can tell it, okay, I want you to go to position and X. So it's going to navigate into the position sub data and then into the X. And that's going to navigate to the floating point value of that specific particle that's called temp. And now I can just design something normally. So this is a normal distribution of floats that's going to create the float value. It's going to assign this float to the position, to the X value of my temporary particle. And I can do this for the others as well. And at the very end, I'm going to put this into my view of particles. Why, why are there this FP with magic numbers? Um, 10 or 100? So there is some person that, um, that determined what good, like good start velocities and good masses are for n-body simulations. And okay. I didn't question it and I don't understand it. Why like the mass, like if it would be, like if you generate random particles while the mass is like 100 from like the x, y coordinates that you would typically have. I guess those are just random values that make uh, sense. So, but that's the way you allocate. So this, this is basic, this is not just allocation that is now also assigning certain starting values. Yes, so this is uh, like, okay. I initialize like my, my particles with some, some, some random initial data. Okay. Good, so I have here my, my few yep. particles. There's a question. Yes, uh, if you have a deeper data structure, then you would pass more variables there with the temp. Yes, so uh, how would that if, if inside my position, I would have like sub position and whatever, I can like queue up as many tags okay. as I want. So what I write here is just like how I navigate this hierarchical struct until I, I arrive at the fundamental element in, the, in this data structure, and there I then can like assign normally to it or pull the value out of memory into a float variable, for example. Okay, now I can call update and I pass this, this view of particles to the update function. So nice, we have a single thing that we can pass. Okay, okay, this is, this is the update function and we can already see that this is a template. So why is this a template? Because this view that's going to be passed in here on the compiler side is a very complicated data type because this view not only needs to know where is the memory stored and what kind of mapping are you going to use, but also what kind of array dimensions do you have and what is the entire type information that you're going to store inside. So like the whole definition here of our particle, that's going to live on as type information inside this view because like the type that the view has, view is a template. This template needs to carry on all this information. And that's why the real fully name of that view is like a free line type name. So that's very complicated because we need to make it this complicated. So this information sticks with this type. So when we pass those views around, this information is always passed around. Then I have my two nested loops here again. And I can compute the particle, particle interaction, take the J particle, take the I particle, pass it to PP interaction. What does Lama independent data mean? So um, there is a macro here that's called Lama independent data. And that is part of a, of a problem. And let's, let's not spend too much time here. But what you tell the compiler here is I'm going to promise to you that if I pass chunks of memory to you, those chunks of memory will not overlap anywhere. Like this is my promise to you. 
because that's a typical program, uh, problem we face in languages like C and C++ when we pass around pointers to, to chunks of memory. So the compiler sees a function, it sees there are two pointers of like some data coming in. The compiler doesn't know if the, the memory behind those pointers will overlap or not. So it needs to abide by the rules of the language. The rules of the language dictate if I do computations on those pieces of memory, and if they might overlap, it, need to, it needs to produce the correct result. But this means that, for example, it cannot do an optimization such as vectorization, where I just take larger bunches of data and compute them and move them back to memory, because this could result in a different result. So that's why the compiler, in many cases, cannot vectorize if it cannot completely prove that pieces of memory are independent of each other. And this is a way of helping the compiler. Should, shouldn't that be part of the data structure description already, or why is it in the code, you know? Why is it, shouldn't, shouldn't this be like a trait of what you're, of, of the data structure you're creating by saying this is, an, this is a property of that structure? Yes, so that is a property of the structure. But also not fully. So let's say like you, you take two views yeah. and in your algorithm. Like you have a function that takes two views and you know each view individually, it doesn't overlap with itself in any way, like proper chunks of memory. But the way your algorithm could talk to these two views, like the compiler wouldn't know, like maybe those views still share something inside of them or, or maybe this view inside has another piece of memory that has a pointer, the pointer is going to point somewhere. Compiler would know. So um, in C, they have a solution for this thing, and that's called restrict. Maybe you've seen this keyword every now and then. So that's a way where I say, compiler, I promise to you that chunk of memory is just unique for itself. Like nobody's going to alias that in any way. And the, the reason why this is not in C++ is because it doesn't scale in a way that if you have a data structure and that has sub data structures, like restrict doesn't propagate through the entire data structure. So long story short, like declaring that a piece of like a data structure is doesn't alias with another data structure has troubles and there is no good solution for that yet. So the best solutions we have in compilers nowadays is, is, is just to tell them for this region of code, all the memory accesses are going to be to independent memory location. This is a promise I'll give to you. This is still the best way we have. But yes, um, Michael, um, I, um, I would like to explore how far we can get here with providing more information to the compilers. But I tried it if I remove the Lama independent data is not going to- So, so that's more like an algorithmic implementation. Yes. So it also like depends on the way the algorithm talks to the various pieces of memory that the compiler can reason about how, how, how this, this memory is used, yeah. Right. Okay, moving on. And I have- Not to shut me off if I'm- Huh? <laughs> no, no, it's just, I'm, I'm seeing where we're taking our time here and that's good. And we're probably going to skip the second half of the talk, which is also fine. Well, we have another seminar like this. It's quite hard to get seminar slots these days. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to call particle-particle interaction here. And you might also notice how uh, there's another weird keyword here. And for CPU implementations, this is just going to tell it, this, is, this function is going to be inline. But I said that Llama is also capable of running on GPUs, for example, and for NVIDIA GPUs specifically, when we, when we, when we want to, to work with CUDA, we need to make certain prefixes to our function. And those prefixes are also hidden behind those macros. So don't worry too much. You can think of this as just inline. More importantly, we have this particle-particle interaction and it takes, again, two pieces of, of information. It takes a particle one and a particle two. And those particles are called virtual datums. And a virtual datum, I'm going to tell you later about that, but it just is a stand-in to identify a single particle. It is kind of a single particle, but it's not a single piece of memory. It's actually like some kind of handle. It identifies a particle somewhere, and it gives you a way of accessing properties of this particle, but it doesn't contain this one particle of itself. It's just some kind of like virtual thingy that says, hi, I'm a particle, but it just points to somewhere else. 
And then again, in the computation, I could just use those tags normally. And what's also quite cool here is I can take from particle one position, from particle two position, and I can add those two up. Shouldn't that be minus? Yeah. Or maybe it should be a minus. I don't know. I'm not a domain expert on, on N bodies. The distance, the distance <laughs> between two points should be a minus. Probably. <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> Let's make it. I understood something. I'm yeah, feeling great. great. <laughs> so as you can see, it's quite uh, fruitful to have a collaboration between uh, computer people and that. Uh, uh, Come on, you're, <laughs> you have been doing computer graphics. I, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the way n bodies work. <laughs> anyway, more importantly, we have a, we have two positions and we run a computation on those positions, and that's a feature of Lama, like you said take not only like single values of a, of, a, of a datum, but like just larger bunches of data and run computations on them. Hi, Inka. Wir sind kurz noch mal da, weil ich den Laptop abgegeben habe, deswegen. So that's going to subtract the one position from the other and it's going to store something here in this and that's going to be another position. So another thingy that has X, Y, and C. It's not going to tell you what exactly it is. It's also some kind of magic. But anyway, like if we hide away the type of information, the code looks almost normal. So how does... Can I ask yeah. But you always need to know about the structure, right? There is no autocomplete or anything to know I can access a position now at this point. Okay, I think the, I didn't get the, the question. The, the, for the particle, it mm -hmm. has a position, but you, if you write this, you only notice if you look at the, at the definition. At yes, the I, need, I need to know that my particle is defined in this way. Just wonder if it will not tell you that if you write something else there that this doesn't exist. Or right. So if I'm going to to to, to mistype here, yeah. I'm going to get a compile error, and the compiler is going to tell me probably like five million lines of template failure or something. So let's let's look at that. It doesn't have an autocomplete. Oh no, sorry. It's it's, it's, it's even easier. Yeah. It tells me that the thing doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let, let's let's let, let's try it. Let's say I, I define a type for that. So that would really exist here, but it's not part of the data structure. It's still compiling. So I now get errors from like within Llama, and that's like you can now see like all this type information, like data element of tag of form or whatever, and something. And somewhere it's going to tell me where is it. No worries. It says somewhere blah, blah, blah. Type is not a class structure union type. Okay, great. Now we don't know anything. Oh, I even have a static assert here. So that's better. It says first tag was not found inside the datum struct. So somewhere inside of Lama, it was trying to look for this inside of a datum struct and it couldn't find it. So I would consider like this is already like a nice serve error message. <laughs> but the compiler is, meta program the compiler is still <laughs> going to puke over you with templates. Why first tag? Why does that just the internal name? Because first tag is the name that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, just from a user perspective, I wouldn't. I would now look for first tag, and I wouldn't find it in my code. Exactly. You so, would wonder like the hell is going on here. And uh, that's what I remember from C++. Yes, very good, very good. That's how most people remember C++ and they write I mean, fully I love complain. It, but the, uh, they write fully complain. It can be improved, maybe. So, of course, it can be improved. It can be improved. And it was not my template. Okay. The, the, the problem is that C++ is not giving us a an, an, an mechanism to uh, define a user uh, or a string for an arrow message which also info, uh, has more information that we can somehow dynamically uh, concatenate uh, strings that we can say really, okay, you try to access pods instead of, of post or something like that. Um, this is a lack of in, inside of the language itself. Wasn't that one of the things that we wanted to bring into the standard? So technically in C++ plus plus 20, std string is a const expert. So I can also like build up string information and then, and then, but I'm not sure if you can actually put that into static insert. With concepts, we can also take a different role and express requirements on certain types that, that might work as well here. 
But the overall gist is like those errors are horrible and they're very hard for the users. And, and that's true. I mean, it's only this if there would be what you wrote there instead of first tag, it would then I would know what. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see here also that the error is produced here at, at, at P1. So I already know like the error is somewhere here. But then I would need to read through it and it's, it, it would tell me this, this, this message here. It's the first tag was not found and you would wonder what, 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 why. And if you would follow up because it he says here, like required from here, required from here, instantiation of that template. And, and here you would somewhere find that it's trying to find the chord within one struct. And there would be a thing called first tag for like this sub algorithm yeah. inside of Lima. And that's where the error occurs. But for now, this is like an error message that tells like in this sub algorithm of Lama, I failed to find the first tag or, or whatever. Yeah. So there is much to be improved here. I didn't came around to do that yet. So we, we now refer to pods. So now we do, do the pods away. That should compile again, nice. Okay, good. By the way, you wrote that code for, for the distance calculation. I think that's still the minus here, is it? Yeah, that's fine. But okay. the rest is a bit strange, but yeah. Honestly, I took the example the way that n body was specified from how it was as part of the, the Lama examples. And I figured, uh, yeah, okay, that's, that's probably how, how n body simulations look like. I didn't. Yeah, it's a bit strange naming, but anyway. <laughs> okay. I figured it's like, like as a, as a, as a as, as a programmer, I, I see I see like memory accesses and floats and all that. The second and third things weird me out. The second and third line. Yeah, I just see variables and, and registers. <laughs> not not kidding. It's very important to 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 uh, name variables in 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 a describing way. So maybe those are really really not great names, but uh, I, I wouldn't really know. I think those are from the CUDA examples. This is maybe the CUDA body example originally. And this is the way the CUDA blog posted about Mbody. <sighs> so thanks for giving me the backstory, because I took this example from my uh, pre predecessor, Alexander Matthias, who was uh, previously before me working on Lama, and he wrote down this example. So now I know where he had it from. <laughs> <laughs> There's Great. always a, a history. Somewhere, somewhere Stack Overflow is involved. <laughs> So what's important here now is that um, we can see again that this code here that, that I have here, it's, it's producing vector instructions. Wow, that's great. But Bernard, so tell me. in line 36, the, the P1, you're not passing the address. It's actually a by value. Or, so line 36, it looks like. So there is a label here. So that, that's no, just no, line number. No, 36 on the code side. Oh, so, OK, yeah. So, the arguments are passed by value. Or, like, yeah. So very, very interesting observation. So Sachin said like this P1 and this P2 is passed by value. And in C++, if we pass something by value, it usually means that it takes a copy of the thing. And then if inside PP interaction, I modify those particles, well, wouldn't I just do that in copies that are thrown away after the function call? Yes and no. Like. Like typically, like for normal structs, if you will pass them by value, the function has the copy, it mutates its copy, and when the function ends, the copies are thrown away, the changes are lost, and so forth. In Lama, those virtual thingies are designed to be like kind of like, like handles. So that's a handle that refers to a particle somewhere else. So I can like freely copy those handles, like a file handle that's just an int, for example. I can make copies of those, but those refer to something elsewhere. And we could argue this is the best design because maybe I really want to pull a copy of a particle that's independent. And currently, I, there is a, a different mechanism to do so, and it does, it's not nice because, like, the standard C way of taking copies is by doing a copy, like having the copy constructor copy the value. And this is not done here, and that's actually counterintuitive. And that's true. That's the way it's currently designed. So we can see this produced vectorized code. Same way we do in pick on GPU is what Sergey says, as particles are also handles. So it could very well be that this was a design decision again of my predecessor to make those like handle types somehow. But I have it in the back of my head that it's a bit of a bit counterintuitive. I haven't come around to, to change that. 
maybe it's more about naming as well. I mean, mainly also just one pointer in C++ plus and it's a pain, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, something that works like this is, is really nice. But if mm -hmm. you name it that everyone knows what it is, then, then it's clear. Maybe right? you would not name the virtual particle, but like just particle handle or something. Yeah, like, so like, it'd be, like I can like use better naming to communicate intent more clear. This is something we could definitely at least do here. To just like make it really obvious for the user, like you're not having a particle in your hands, you're dealing with something that refers to it. So, yeah. And um, uh, what, what information? Uh, um, uh, it, it is nowadays also, I saw it in other libraries, uh, more or less common to not use uh, the sign anymore for a deep copy. And if you like to have a deep copy of something, really provide a function which is really doing a deep copy, where you really then write inside of your code, do a deep copy of this particle. Uh, and everything else is, is, is then more a lightweight. So it, is, uh, it could be a handle, and then only it is uh, 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 cloning the handle. So that you really know where the deep copy is. In C++, you have the, the problem with the sign. You don't know, is it a deep copy? Is it uh, only a handle behind? And, and um, uh, if you break the, the typical way how you program uh, C++, it is sometimes a little bit more obvious and you really know what's going on. Because with the smart pointer and every song thing, you don't know really, is there a, a buffer behind? Is there only one in the band? Is it really? plain data or is it only an, an handle to it and uh, avoiding uh, using the assign for a copy is sometimes uh, better but not as common I think. So thank, thank you for that explanation and, and giving a bit more context. Um, different languages than C++ deal differently with what it means if I just assign a value somewhere or if I take a copy of a variable. I mean, many, especially managed languages like Java, C Sharp, for example, when you, when you copy a thing, it's like you don't take a full deep copy of the entire object. So why does that make sense? Because copies are usually expensive. If you have larger pieces of data, each time you pull a copy, that's going to cost you time. Maybe your memory allocations and, and whatever. So we try to, to really avoid taking unnecessary copies. But the default in C++ is whenever you just pass something around, it makes copies everywhere. So maybe this is not the best default. So not the point of arguing here. But so people came up with this idea, what if we designed more types in C++ in a way that if you take copies of them, they don't copy the full content behind it. So it like makes the code simpler for some people and it avoids, avoids copies here and there. And if I really want to do the copy, I want to very explicitly specify this. And some types that come to my mind that do that recently are, for example, string view or, or like array view or span, which are types that just point to subregions of some data elsewhere. And you can just take copies of them. They're very cheap to copy around because they're not types that store the memory or hold the memory behind of it, but just like refer to something. They're very lightweight objects. And we see more of those lightweight, ob lightweight objects coming to C++. Okay, so what I now want to show you, and this is the entire magic that I was um, trying to build up like the last 70 minutes, is we have this variable up here, this constant mapping. And um, if you remember that mapping chooses which kind of mapping we, we, we choose here to allocate our view. And currently mapping is one, so it will produce a struct of array mapping. And we already see the vector instructions here on the right. So if I would change this mapping variable now to produce an array of struct mapping, like the vectorization should go away and I should have a scalar version again of, of my program. And this is what I want to show you here. If I switch out the mapping here, and I still want to emphasize like the way PP interact works, the way update works, the way move works. Move is by the way, like the update of the particle positions by the velocities. The way I initialize all those particles, like all of the code stayed exactly the same. But the way the data is represented, the memory in the background completely got, 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 um, got redirected. And we can see here that now we have like all this scalar code again, and this is like really the same assembly as we had in the very first version of the end body where we had our simple struct. And 
this is like the magic that Llama tries to tries to, to produce for the user. It's not the best interface possible. It doesn't feel as good if I just have my, sim my, my simple struct, but it is the required mechanism. And I really tried to make this API that Llama gives the user as minimal as possible. So it's like the minimal possible interface that you can program against. So behind the algorithm, you have like the program has the full flexibility to just change the data layout in any way. So here we have seen array of struct and struct of array, but like Llama is built in a way you can plug in any kind of mappings. You can even invent your own, define your own and, 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 and whatever. But this is the minimal mechanism on the user side that's needed. So I can like pull those two, um, those two concepts apart, the way that data is stored in memory and the way it's accessed in the program. Because in C++ and C, this is linked together. And with Llama, I can pull this apart and I can put a piece of information in between that governs how this is translated, like how the access in the algorithm is translated to a memory location. Good. That was a very long introduction. And let's maybe just benchmark that real quickly. And this is addresses what, what Attila mentioned before, like what speed up is possible here. And these are just the measurement of just I think it was a desktop workstation at CERN. And here we have the array of struct version and one call to that update function that like just does like the two nested loops and updates each particle by all other particles. That's going to take 1.2 seconds in our array of struct example. And if we go to the struct of array, that one with the nine vectors that was not so nice to use, that actually gave a significant speed up. So that's around like a factor of three, two, three, like three, more three. So that's a significant increase in, 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 in throughput of our data. And the Llama versions are put next to each other, and we can see that they nicely perform almost the same. They are just slightly, slightly bit faster. I don't know why exactly. I could imagine because Llama uses a different strategy of allocating memory that that maybe has a certain property because it's more aligned memory. Like there could be some side effect that I haven't explored yet. But the gist is that like with Llama, I have the same program and I can switch and tell Llama behave like an array of struct, or I can just change a single digit and I tell the program behave like a struct of arrays. And this I can switch. And we can see this very notably that this has a huge impact on the way that my code is going to perform. Good. Are there any questions so far? Yes. Totally unrelated to this slide, but uh, to something you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. so you said you had these these uh, macros that you use in front of the functions to be able to use uh, CUDA and so on. Mm -hmm. So the code you've shown, is this is this runnable without changes also on top of CUDA, or do I need to adjust something? No, because uh, Llama is just a library that abstracts away the memory access patterns. So it doesn't have any facilities to like launch a kernel or to, like, like get access to your GPU device. And this is where I mentioned previously that Llama tries to integrate with Alpaca, because Alpaca is a library that tries to abstract the way acceleration devices like GPUs or like coprocessors, whatever. And Llama tries to create like a parallel index space, like a space of parallel threads that can run computations. And Llama is going to try to provide a really nice memory layout for those computations, but those both address independent aspects. So, but the Llama examples you've seen here, you would still need to have some kind of framework or just use CUDA directly or like OpenMP5 or OpenACC, like some kind of acceleration technology to, to bring those computations to the GPU. Okay. Okay, I, thank you. I see there is some questions in the chat. See if the cursor works. Um, I have not the same clock speed. We talked about the pick and GPU uh, template errors. We can we have concepts, particle concepts. Upon this also in general, more modern C plus plus with move construction. Okay, so in C plus plus twenty, we get a, a few new features to make those like compile time error messages a little more readable and uh, and a little better, and. So there are ways we can improve in the future. That's, that's maybe the gist here. Okay, good. So that was like one fourth of the talk. So, so, so how about we just, we just do the talk again? So let's, let's recapitulate what, what we have seen again, because it's, it's, it's really important to like get those various like little aspects. 
The suit of Naaman alpaca should be called camel eye <laughs> or something like that. Yes, I'm also in favor of that. <laughs> camel ID. So, so there is somebody else in the room who's currently working on it on, on another library here that, that's called. Please, please tell it to us. It's called Bactria. It's called Bactria, which oh, is the okay. of those family of animals. So I don't know if that then fits camel ID or something. Camelidae would be the ah, camelidae. group. Camelidae. That's the biological family. Both belong. Great. It is already back to guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there will be more libraries and they will be named after cute animals that, that give wool and have four legs. And, and that's nice. Okay. Anyway. So coming back again. So we've seen like Lama has this concept of a datum domain. This is where I describe my single datum. And we have the structure on the left side, the particle position, velocity is mass. And on the right side, I have this, this way of having tag types in Lama and then having these nested templates to, to describe the state structure. That's the datum domain. And also, as I can like pull those apart in, in, in C++, like have my separate struct for, for a vector, I can also in Lama, since those are just nested types, I can just pull like one of those type lists outside of a particle and define my data structure back with x, y, and z, and then use it twice. In, in, inside here when I define position and velocity. So there is this analogy between the way that we have structs and the way we have those, those nested templates that, that Lama uses. Okay, that's again an explanation uh, on how that works. Notice also here we have, we have an array. So then Lama also has DA, that's for datum array, and that's a bool of, of, of four size. So that's an array of four bools. We haven't had that yet in the examples. Then we have this array domain. So that specifies like the dimensionality and the extents of the array that you're going to build on top of your datum domain. And that's a similar concept than uh, the alpaca grid, the, the CUDA grid, or in OpenCL, you have this n-dimensional range. So that's kind of like I replicate the datum I have in n dimensions with n sizes. And this array domain here holds this information. So at, at this point, you don't specify you don't specify what uh, you put into this array. Right? It's just creating a grid or something. Yes. So this you does not tell zero initialize the data. It doesn't tell anything on how the like on how the values will look like inside those arrays. It just contains the information. I'm going to use a five dimensional array, and those five values are the extent of the arrays. It just tells how big this array space is. That's the only information. It so holds. it does not create the, those particle objects on those. No, it doesn't create anything. It doesn't create uh, doesn't create particles. It also doesn't create a buffer for this or holds memory anything. It's just an object that tells you I have dimension two and I have two sizes. Good. Then we have seen those mappings. Those mappings are also themselves objects that represent how data is mapped to memory. And these mappings, they take the, the array domain and the datum domain. So they take those pieces of information, the way the struct looks inside, the way the arrays are built on top of that, and then defines like how the memory mapping looks like. If I take an element in this array and then position X, like how is that going to be uh, trans, uh, transformed into a memory address? This is what this object governs, like this AOS, this defines how indices from arrays and, and datum are going to be um, put into memory. And Lama has a few of those, like array of structs, struct of array. We also have this, this array of struct of array, and there is something called tree mapping, and we will skip that today. So here is an image on how that actually looks like in memory, because in Lama I can just, because Lama actually knows about how this, how this is going to be put into memory, it can put you a nice image of how this looks like. And that's an array of struct mapping. So we can see again here, starting from the very top, there is a position X of the element 0, 0, and of the element 0, 0, there's position Y, and the position C of 0, 0, and so forth. Like that's just going to be laid out from left to right and from top to bottom. So it goes left, right, then we start with the next row. This is how this is going to be put into memory. 
If we take the structure of array, we can see that this is kind of transposed. So first we lay out all the position axes of the elements 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and so forth. And then there is the mixed, uh, the array of struct of array, where we take always eight values together. So that's going to put eight position axes, then eight position y's, eight position c's, and, and so forth. Okay, in Lama we allocated few, so we take the mapping, we call alloc few, that's going to give us a few. And this is the place where the actual allocation happens. So this is where Lama is going to reserve a chunk of memory. It's going to ask the mapping, how much memory do you need to transform all the values the user wants to have into a chunk of memory? How much memory do you need? Then I'm going to request a piece of memory and I'm going to put all the information, the mapping, the chunk of memory, I'm going to put it together into a few. And this is what I'll give to the user. This is what I'll give to the programmer. So the programmer has now a few that contains all the mapping information, holds all the memory. And Lama supports various ways of like, choosing a different strategy of allocating. And I'll just make it brief. Um, there is support for, for pieces of memory that are held by shared pointers, by vectors, or just live on the stack. So there's like a different degree of how I can optimize on if I want to do a heap allocation, or maybe I have a very small few and some data I can keep it on the stack. And this also governs, like if I have a few that's based on shared pointers, if I would copy the few, they would share the, the same memory, for example. But this is just something in the back. So as a user, you would just use Lama alloc few, and that usually does the right thing for you. This is a way of customizing how it allocates. Then on the few itself, I can index on the few. And the way I index is I need to index with coordinates that correspond to my array domain. So if my array domain is one dimensional, I can put single integers in here. If my array domain is two dimensional, I need to use two indices to, to, to index into this. Or I can also use an object of type array domain. So I can construct an array domain with like two free integers, whatever, and use that to index. And also note, we can use the brackets or the, the parentheses for indexing. So this goes to the few and takes out a single particle. On the single particle, we've seen I can use those tag types to index into it, and there are various ways of doing that. One is using the actual tags, but Lama internally then maps those tags to like sub indices. So it knows it's the zero, the one, the second element inside the structure. And this is what Lama calls datum cores. So I can also like, like with an index, index into those, those structures. I can, uh, I can. Um, how do you say, like I can treat them as if they were a tuple of values, for example. But for the user, it's probably nicer to just index with, with the tags he defined. So if I have a particle P that I pulled out of the view, I can then like ask for position X and I will get a reference to that float outside. And in the background, that view is going to go through that mapping and it's going to retrieve a location inside the allocated buffer. And this is where this float lives. And I don't need to worry about that. This is hidden from me. Then I briefly mentioned the virtual datum, and this is what comes back if, if I access the view at a certain position. I get out something that I call virtual datum because this is not an actual particle, an actual datum element. It's not something that contains the memory and the data. It just points somewhere inside of the view. And at every access I do, this virtual datum just aggregates the information of the access. So if I go uh, into the view at position post, I'll get a virtual datum of that view, and it contains inside the position where I went to. If I now take this datum and I ask for a position, like the position substruct of, of a particle, I'll get a virtual datum back that knows it belongs to this view. It was at the position that I put into the view, and it knows it is currently a datum core zero. So like that's the zero sub thingy of a particle. So it just aggregates up this information. And when I'll do the final access, now I go to the value x inside this virtual datum that already knows it's inside position. That will finally resolve then to like a leaf element of this tree of the, of the data structure that I have. And this will then trigger resolving to a memory address. And this will then finally retrieve the value that, that, that I want to. This is going to retrieve the piece of memory that I'm navigating to just as a side note. 
Okay, then we've seen we can also put a single view on the stack. Uh, yeah, maybe just skip that. I can have a single particle and then move the particle later into the view. So it behaves like a view of one element. And we've previously seen those operators. So I can also do collective operations on all the elements uh, inside of the datum. So I can take a single particle and then write the value two to it. And this will write the value two to all position X, Y, C, mass, velocities, X, Y, C, and, and so forth. I can like ask the datum for the position and then write one to all of those. So there are a few like neat little tricks uh, and how I can use those operators to talk to multiple elements at the same time. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's that, that's for the eight. I'll skip through that as well. Um, okay. So I mentioned that uh, Lama integrates quite nicely with Alpaca, and here is an example of, of both of the APIs. So, quick question: Who is not familiar with Alpaca? Okay, most of you. That, that's great. So Alpaca is a technology, as I mentioned previously, that abstracts away uh, talking to acceleration devices. So it abstracts away accessing your NVIDIA GPU via CUDA. It abstracts away your AMD GPU that you access via HIP, maybe. It can abstract away OpenMP if you want to use that kind of technology. But it gives you also a kind of API that you can talk to. And in the back, it's going to map to CUDA, MP, uh, OpenMP, um, HIP, or, or whatever. So on those acceleration devices, we also quite often need pieces of memory. Like we need to create buffers and those buffers live on the GPU and we run computations on them. So Alpaca also has APIs to, to create buffers. But since Llama wants to manage those buffers, there is like a kind of like conflict of, of interest here. Like on the one side, Llama wants to have the buffers because it wants to govern how data access is mapped into those buffers. But on the other side, Alpaca knows how to get those buffers using CUDA, using OpenMP, using um, uh, OpenMP 5 or, or whatever. So this is an example that shows how those two APIs could play together. And in Alpaca to create a buffer, you would call Alpaca membuff alloc. And then I can pass in a device, and that device is, for example, your NVIDIA GPU and so forth, and I can pass in a size. And that's going to allocate the buffer that holds as many bytes, and it's going to live on my GPU. And in Alpaca, I can then retrieve the native pointer out of that buffer. So that will give me a pointer to the first element of the buffer, but that pointer is going to be a pointer in the address space of the target device. So that might sound very confusing. So what it means is if that buffer lives on the GPU, uh, the pointer value that I get here is the pointer that's actually, that has the address on the GPU inside. So I can use then this pointer to access this memory if I'm inside of GPU code. So let's say I'm running inside of a GPU kernel, I can use this pointer to talk to my buffer that lives with me on my GPU. So I can take this pointer and now I can just create a llama view using a llama mapping that I've described before and I can pass in this pointer. And there is an array for a reason and I'm not going to explain it to you in detail. It just means like llama can use multiple chunks of memory to in, in the background, but it's not important. What's important here is llama can take an existing piece of memory, just create a few and uses that memory. So this way, Alpaca can deal with how to get the memory from somewhere, and Llama can then use that and manage it in some way. And in Alpaca, there is also a second way of, of getting memory, because in many um, um, accelerator technologies, I have something that's called a shared memory. And I'll not also not dive into too much detail here, but it's memory that's shared between certain threads. And there is a function in Alpaca that can give you a piece of shared memory. It's called Alpaca block shared st alloc var because it's allocating a shared variable. I can say that's an amount of bytes. It has a certain size. And that's going to give me like a shared piece of memory. And I can again like use this shared area of memory, pass it into Llama, and Llama can use this piece of memory to and then like have a mapping on tap. And I can use this view, like both of these Llama views here. I can just use, as I showed you in the examples previously, but it's going to talk to a GPU buffer. It's going to talk to a shared memory inside the GPU. So this is like the interface between those two technologies. Okay. 
That's it for the part that uh, shows the Llama library itself, how it's going to be used, a little, a little bit of benchmarks. Um, yeah, let's see how much time we have, because I think we're probably like getting to the end of the seminar. We had one and a half hours in. So there was the main part of the talk, the main half. The remaining part of the talks are actually like three independent pieces that more look into like what is a bit of the theory behind these mappings, how we can formulate that using some math. And there is a piece on, on like specifically how those llama mappings work like. And I forgot what the last piece was. <laughs> I did it yesterday at like midnight, I forgot what it was. <laughs> but there are three pieces. So my question is now, how do you feel? Do you feel like you, you want to continue with one of those pieces or, or would you like to take a break and we move them to a different seminar? Because now would be a time where we could make a good cut, for example. So who would like to continue? Can, can you continue in 30 minutes? Well, everything. I can speed up and push that through in 30 minutes, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Anybody wants to have a break and move move on with his life, just get away from this weird zoo of animals, which is horrible <laughs> and the template beta programming. Until I want to speak. No, but okay. Okay. I have a question actually before you proceed. Yeah, tell me. Can you go one slide back? Sure. Can Llama handle the allocation for me as well? So can I just call the Llama allocation function and pass it to Alpaca? Or does it have to be pre-allocated by Alpaca and then I pass it to Llama? So uh, my predecessor, Alexander Matthias, who worked on this Llama library, he initially designed it in the way that you could have an Alpaca allocator and use that in Llama alloc view. So Llama would have like a mechanism of using Alpaca in the back to provide the buffer of memory. It turned out, just writing like the code for that allocator was a few hundred lines. It was huge. And I figured it would actually be much more generic if Llama just had an interface of like, give me a pointer somewhere and I'm going to make use of the lamp, uh, that memory. Because then I don't need to come up with a, a buffer-based allocator, a shared memory-based allocator, a CUDA allocator, whatever, like whatever technology you're using. So that's like how I redesigned the API to be very, very generic on where this memory can come from. So no Llama on purpose cannot use Alpaca to, to get memory. And that's part of the design. So I can decouple those two aspects. Okay. Would, 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 it be, would it be possible to have an allocation policy? Or, or is it what, what uh, is, uh, was before in Llama? This is what we had before in Llama. So if we go back to this uh, allocator slide. Ah, okay. So there was an allocator, there was an Alpaca allocator. Uh, alpaca buffer allocator and there was an alpaca um, shared memory based allocator but as i said those implementations they were they were large-ish and they were of course like specifically tied to alpaca and the shared memory alpaca and the buffer so if you would want to let's say you just use cuda because maybe you really want to use cuda and not alpaca you would need to write your own allocator again with like all the gory details that works with cuda malloc and to free free Llama from the burden of having to write these allocators, my decision was to just design an interface that can take a point to do anywhere, and then if you can make use of the memory that's behind this. Oh, okay. So for, yes, there for was me, a policy-based design. For me, your current approach looks like more than a reinterpret re cast. Yes, and this is what's going to happen. So, so what you have seen here correctly is that I'm talking about buffers of bytes. So I allocate bytes buffers. I'm not allocating float buffers or in buffer or like, like structured buffers. I'm just allocating pure storage. And Llama is then reinterpreting the storage and puts floats inside there. It puts, uh, it puts doubles in whatever kind of data types you have in your program. It's going to reinterpret those bytes and it's going to put the values and lay out them there. That's true. Like Llama, like what you pass here is not some kind of memory with structured data. You just pass in raw storage that Llama then starts to organize itself. How do I know the number of bytes I need? Can I just call size of the Llama type definition? So a Llama mapping has a function that's like get blob size, and it tells you how much of memory you need to provide so that the mapping can map all the, the, the values that are described by array and datum domain 
into a linear chunk of memory. So the mapping is going to tell you how much memory do you need, so I can map all the values somewhere. Okay, cool. Yes, that's right. I didn't show this in this example. Okay, uh, one more question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say I want to iterate over the X positions in the n-body example. Can Lama tell me if the Xs are contiguous in memory? Like a compile time? Oh, very well, like that's the fear. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, no kidding, uh, no kidding. It's not on the slides, but that's a, that's a very valid point. Because also as a compiler, you're very interested. If you have a loop and you iterate over successive things, are those things contiguous in memory? Because if I know, like the floats that you're going to iterate over, they're all next to each other. I know I can vectorize. So this is an important information. It's an important property in a mathematical sense of those mappings, because a mapping essentially describes how I can map some kind of index into a linear memory address offset, like a linear memory offset. And I want to know, yes, from the way I iterate or the way I access a data structure, is that going to result in contiguous memory addresses? This is an interesting property. And what was the question? <laughs> If Lama can, can tell me as a programmer if those. So Lama for now cannot tell you that. So Lama currently still relies that the compiler can see this. Mm -hmm. So Lama tries to like put this mapping fun functions like this, because this eventually is a, plus, a C function that implements this mapping. So Lama tries to make this mapping in a way that the compiler can see ah, if my loop variable increases by one, like the address that comes out here increases by size of float. And the day compiler can say, yes, I know what to do. I can take, I can vectorize this. So Lama tries to make that possible for the compiler. But we are not there yet that like, I can see this as a property of the mapping fund. Like ideally, I would like to ask the algorithm, how, you, how is your access pattern? I want to ask the mapping, how is your pattern of, of like mapping that to memory? Is that contiguous? And then maybe like really in part of the library already emit vector instructions or not for example. Like that would be very interesting, but I also think it's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a debugging tool where you see, in, for example, the thing you showed in the browser, we see mm -hmm. colors, this can be vectorized and this. Mm -hmm. so, uh, do you one use debugging tools other than this? What, what do you use? Well, I, I what debugging tools do I use? So um, honestly, I look at a lot of assembly these days. <laughs> Because, because I think it's the fundamental truth. Um, you can also, of course, like, like, like print out the numbers of, of offsets that the mapping produces, for example, to get a feeling of like how the mapping behaves. I also like the pictures that I, I, I showed you before. Like for a, lap, uh, a mapping, I can ask them like dump your memory layout. So I can look at that and see, okay, this, this would make sense for the compiler to vectorize. I know the compiler cannot vectorize this because the mapping function is already too complicated for the compiler to grasp. So this is, I know, like I have some space still as a programmer where I need to get better at, this, at describing to the compiler that he can really vectorize here. That like there, there, there are blocks or chunks of eight pieces that you can always use in parallel. So I can make a better job here. I'm having a little trouble with the word debugger here because for me, debugger means like runtime inspecting of the program. And something that Lama tries very hard to do is make those optimizations at compile time. So you want to like prove based on static information in the program that certain optimizations are possible. There's a whole lot of literature and it's also quite interesting that for example, measures the runtime behavior of a program. So like I, I really look like at every memory access and every memory cell touched in a program and then I can make decisions based on that and like, like rewrite the executable or annotate it back into the source code, compile a better version. It's like some kind of profile guided optimization. There are uh, interesting techniques for that, but Lama specifically tries to focus on a compile time solution. Does it answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Maybe another one. Yeah, uh, tell me. So I got the impression that using Lama relies on having an acceler accelerator that, that, that you need. Is, is that correct? Um, or no. So for, at least from my understanding of accelerator, an accelerator for me is another computing device that's not the CPU. Is, is that correct? Yeah, okay. That's okay. what I meant. So you can use Llama in conjunction with the GPU. Like you can have a Llama view 
that lives on your GPU and determines how your GPU is going to access the, the, the data in the GPU buffer. But Lama just works absolutely fine on your CPU. And the examples we've seen before on Compiler Explorer with the assembly, this is just normal CPU side code, nothing related to accelerators there. And this is a design goal for Lama to just be universally applicable on your CPU code, on your GPU code, or I have heard there are even people doing FPGAs and like weird stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it should be universally applicable. So we try to make this standard C++ so we can use it together with many different technologies. So it shouldn't be tied to an accelerator. If it just works with CUDA, it would be really sad. Good. So we have around 15 minutes left. Um, let's maybe skip the mapping theory. Why? Because this is a chapter that I specifically intended for Michael, because Michael asked me a lot about this. Just to give you a brief overview, it just tries to kind of like create a formalism, a formalism for that by, by saying like a datum domain. It's kind of like I can like numerate all of those and then I have sets of like indices into this and my array domain that's going to form tuples and whatnot, and then I can define an index set, and a mapping function M is like maps an index set to some kind of offset set, it's like memory offsets. Then I can define a few helpers, and no worries about this, but eventually I can define my mappings, like this is like how I map array of struct, giving an array index and the datum index, how this is going to result in a memory address. Okay, as I said, like don't worry about that, I, I think I want to talk about this on a separate talk, and especially also when Michael is here. Okay, some interesting observations. Um, how do mappings look like in Llama? That's, that's maybe a little bit more relevant and interesting now at that point. So we've seen this array of struct, struct of array objects that we have in Llama, but you can define your own, like plug in your own mapping. So there's like certain requirements that Llama has on those mapping objects that it deals with. And specifically, it asks for like, I want your mapping to tell me what your array domain is, what your datum domain is. So I already construct a mapping on an array domain and a datum domain. But then I construct this mapping somewhere outside and then I give it to a Lama view. And the Lama view asks the mapping, okay, what's the array domain? What's the datum domain? How many pieces of memory, like how many chunks of memory do you need to store these this mappings? And what is the size of those chunks? Like usually in Llama, most mappings just use one chunk of memory, but we made the interface generic at the moment. So in theory, a mapping could decide, I'm going to map the data space you described to me into like seven chunks of memory, because why not? It, it could do that. So, so the interface is open to this. So the mapping tells you block count, how many chunks of memory do you need? What is the size of memory that you need for each of those blocks? And then the, the most interesting function, because this is what's going to determine where a thing is mapped to, is called get blob number and offset. And that's going to take a coordinate inside of this, this nested template structure, and it's going to take a coordinate in the area you're currently asking for. So like it's going, if you ask for the i particle position x, this information will be passed in here. So you ask here, this will contain the value of this i, this i particle, this is like position X here, and then get blob number and offset tells you, okay, take this piece of memory, go to this offset. This is where you will find your value. This is what the mapping does. So this is the, the function of main interest. And I have here the, the entire definition of this mapping. And for you, it's mostly relevant to see that this is not 1000 lines of like ultra complicated C++, it still contains some, some templates and it might not be too easy to write for everybody, but this is basically what we need to change inside of Llama. So if you want to describe your own way of how data is mapped to memory, this is the piece of, of thing that you touch or you would change. And this is really the complete thing. So there is like no, nothing more that, that, that's hidden here unless if you help a function. And most interestingly here, when we map uh, such a datum cord and an array thing to memory, like specifically for the area of struct, like the computation would be, I take this n-dimensional array cord, I kind of linearize this into a linear cord, then I multiply it with the size of the datum domain, so like the size of the, the nested structure we have, and then I, I take a certain offset of that coordinate like into the struct inside. 
And this is the computation that, that gives you the memory address on where to look for your data. And funnily enough, this is also the same kind of calculation that your compiler would do if you would just use a plain struct. If you would just define a struct, then you have an array of those and you would write array at position i dot post dot x. Like the compiler sees this in your program and what it does is it knows, okay, you're talking to the i thing, so I'm going to take i times the size of the struct plus the offset of position x inside that struct and this is where I'm going to go to memory. This is literally what your compiler, what your GCC, what your Clang does internally when it sees that you write array at position i.post.x. And Lama gives you a way of specifying this as a part of a software library. So I lifted a piece of compiler world out into a software library and give a programmer the chance to play and mess with this. And as we can see, this is not incredibly complicated. So this is really the, the, the mapping function that maps the array of struct into memory. For a comparison, if you want to have a struct of array, it's a bit more work. It uses a bit of different code. But anyway, like it's, we have a few multiplications. We take a few offset. We take a few sizes. We compute them together. And that gives you an offset value on where you go to memory. And then also the array of struct of array, that's the more complicated one because it also involves a division and a, a, a modulus because it needs to determine like what kind of subblock are you talking to, what kind of index inside the subblock are you, are you talking to. And as you can see here, this mapping gets more complicated and we need to keep in mind every time we, we access a piece of data, the, like, the processor needs to run through this function to know where to go to memory. So like every, Every instruction, like every add, every multiplication, especially those divisions, they need to be executed each time I just retrieve a single value from memory. So it's very, very important that those mapping functions are also incredibly simple and efficient to compute. Because this is what the processor needs to evaluate each time it asks for a piece, a piece of thing from the memory. And in this case, this is already too complicated for the compiler to vectorize. Like it looks at this and this is, oh my God, I cannot reason. If like, if I would pass in like eight successive array coordinates, like you say, like you have a loop that goes over the elements in your, in your particles array, the compiler can no longer see that if that loop index increases sequentially, that the offsets that come out of this function also increase by size of float, for example. The compiler can no longer reason this from this function. It's already too complex. But this is also where the theory at some point kicks in because we can see what the computation is here and maybe we can prove in a mathematical way that for this implementation, this would yield offsets that are contiguous. Like it would be really cool at some point and I have a long way to go in my PhD about this. It's like, can we prove given this implementation that increasing the array indices by one will yield an increase of size of element and on the memory address. Because if we can prove that, we can just throw, like we can just force vectorize on top. Even if the compiler cannot see through the implementation of how we go to memory, I know this is going to be contiguous and I can force the compiler, you must vectorize here because I just know it's going to be in the right memory layout. How do you do that? Pardon me? How do you do that? How would I do that? So there are uh, libraries and I can also use uh, vector intrinsics, for example, specifically. And I can tell, and that's a very good question actually, because on the outside in my program, I still wrote a normal loop. I wrote like a four that counts from zero to N and then it asks for the I, like the one, the second, the third and so forth. If I want to vectorize this code explicitly, like I explicitly want to um, use a type there that says I'm representing eight elements. And when I'm going to add those two variables together and that's a vector of eight, that's a vector of eight, that means it also needs to be an instruction of adding eight together. That kind of changes the way my loop works. Like I can no longer use a, uh, use a loop that counts from zero, one, two. I actually need a loop that counts from zero, eight, 16, and then always uses eight at the same time. So on the user side, that would also imply some kind of like new magic loop that, that does that, or like a way of like an algorithm that says like Lama for each. And then you say, I'm going to go over the entire array. And then Lama internally can say, is this a mapping that can vectorize? And if it is, 
then I can explicitly like, uh, like describe the computation in vector types. And this way I'm forcing the compiler because then literally in the code, there is like the intrinsic that emits this vector instruction, or there's a type used that forces the compiler to emit this vector instruction. But yes, like on the on the client side, on people that use the Llama library, then you would also need to rethink or redesign the way you write loops. And this is very annoying. Okay. Good, there's the tree mapping. I'm going to skip that. Nice tree mapping. I also meant because you mentioned the, the, the debugger, there's also this nice idea because a mapping is essentially just an object with the requirement that I listed before. A mapping has this function like compute the memory address, give me the size of the plot. It has some properties. I can like wrap things over it as long as they produce the same interface. And that, that, that's quite cool actually, because now I can define another mapping, I call it trace, and it can just take an existing mapping. It just needs to provide the same interface. Like, like the trace mapping has the same functions as another mapping, and then it just calls its inner mapping. And mathematically, that's the equivalent of just like calling the mapping function on the inputs of the other mapping. And it, this gives me a way of like, like for example, adding instrumentation to, to mapping. Because every memory access that Llama does, it runs through the mapping. So each time you just access a single piece of data, it's going to go through the mapping. So I would just wrap like a thin layer on top of that. Like, like, like on each memory access, you would go through the thin layer and that would then go to the real mapping. So this gives me a way of like observing all memory access in the entire program. And that would give me a way of, for example, doing some kind of runtime profiling. Can you do that during compiling as well? You know I can do that during compiling. I'm, I mean, I cannot, I cannot measure the amount of memory accesses because that depends on the yeah. like, algorithm loop behavior. And if you want the tool that tells you during compiling that this can be vectorized, mm -hmm. can you use something like this? Can you add a layer like this? Or? Mm -hmm. I don't think we can add a layer like this, but as I also said previously, like we, we were very interested in the properties of mappings depending on, on their implementation. So I would li very much like to have something where I can ask, will this produce contiguous memory accesses given SOA? And then at compile time, I can look into SOA, I can look into the implementation of get block number and offset, and at compile time, I can prove in a way, this is going to be a contiguous access. And that would be a very interesting functionality. But I cannot do this like with this, I just wrap, wrap myself over, over the other map. Okay, how would it look like if I would run that, it could then after the program tell me, okay, those were the amounts of memory accesses you did to those certain values. And that could already give me a clue because if I count, for example, can see the position is accessed twice as often as velocity. Maybe this could be interesting for me. Maybe I could say, okay, maybe I should, like focus more on getting positions into caches or shared memory and velocity is not accessed so often, for example, and I can keep it in slow kind of memory. I, I could base decisions on, on this behavior. Another interesting idea is split mapping because I could just define a mapping that looks like, are you going to talk to positions or to, to anything else? Because if you're going to talk to positions, I'm going to map with structure arrays and if you talk to anything else, I'm going to map with array of struct, for example, because why not? And that's the mathematical equivalent of like having, I have a mapping function that depending on the input designs to forward to a different mapping function. So I can also like compose, compose those mappings in, in a way. And this looks a little bit more complicated if you write that in C++, because I'll define the mapping again, array domain, the, the datum domain, the particle, I need to have a way of specifying what to split into the one mapping, what to split in the other mapping. So here I tell you like everything under datum core zero is going to be split on the SOA and the other thing is going to split in the AOS. And that's going to be best, best described with a picture, like that will produce this memory layer. Now all the positions are laid out as the struct of array and the rest just, just, just after each other. So I wouldn't know if that would make sense in this specific occasion, but it's cool that this feature exists. And maybe like using the trace mapping, I could see that like 
The positions are always accessed in a nice way. For example, I could also use the trace mapping, for example, to add runtime, see if the accesses are contiguous. Maybe that would help me. So I could then use a split mapping and say, okay, I'll need to align the positions in a way that's vectorizable. And the other, for the others, it doesn't matter because maybe they are not accessed as often or it's important to keep like the data of the same particle together. So I think there is a lot of, a lot of opportunity to define interesting mappings here. And I think that's about the, the end. The end of our, what I want to convey to you is that Lama tries to define this API that you can program against, and it gives you this, this platform of defining mappings inside this library. And this is what Lama essentially is. I think Lama doesn't, uh, will not try to solve how to vectorize your code as best as possible. It sits a little bit below that. It gives you a framework, gives you an API to program against, and it gives you an infrastructure so you can define interesting mappings. And in this way, you could then like write another software library that can use Lama underneath of it to then like do algorithms that can vectorize nicely, for example. Good. And that's a really, really interesting problem that we will talk about next time, probably. Good. Are there any more questions on your side? It's three minutes to lunchtime. <laughs> any more questions? I think I'll have a last slide here. Yeah. I would suggest you like, like try it out maybe. I know it's like in a kind of like prototypic state, so it's not super production quality library, but it can do some interesting stuff already. You can find it on GitHub. There is some documentation. There is all the Doxygen documentation for the source code. And if you just want to mess around a little bit in Compiler Explorer, that's that's the header file you can include. It's hosted as one of my gists on, 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 on GitHub. Give it a try. Tell me what you think. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's free plus. <laughs> <laughs> Is that even legal? <laughs> no, no, because it's a pre increment and does doesn't work in an R value. So anyway. I have any more questions? I have one last question. It has a bit into Alpaca. Uh -huh. I was thinking about redesigning the Alpaca kernel language in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ran into the problem of having different loading and storing strategies for memory. I was wondering if this would tie to Lama or if this is something I need to solve in, in Alpaca itself. So let's say I want to load something, I want to also cache it in the shared memory on the GPU, for example. Mm -hmm. Would I put this into Llama and just say load and it's automatically stored in shared memory in the background, or would I have to do this myself in the, in the long run? It's an interesting question um, because um, when I started with Llama, people came to me with many ideas, like especially this one, like, oh, we could have like a, some kind of Llama view and it automatically caches in shared memory if that's reasonable and, and, and whatnot. And the more I worked with Llama, the more I, uh, I realized that Llama tries to solve a very specific thing, and this is I have one chunk of memory, or maybe a few chunks of memory. I want to determine how the layout in this one chunk looks like. Mm -hmm. So what you are asking is, I have two pieces of memory. I have one that lives in a GPU buffer, and I have like a small section of, of shared memory that's like close to my streaming multiprocessors on, on the GPU that's going to be accessed very fast. And I want to use this as a cache. So I write an algorithm that's going to work on data in a global buffer, but before I run like subparts of this algorithm, I want to prefetch chunks into this local, local shared memory. And I realized over time that this is something that sits on top of Llama. You would have like a like Llama view to, to manage the global buffer. You would have your Llama view of managing the shared memory buffer. And we could argue that maybe Llama could be used in a way of creating a very good copy between those buffers, because maybe you want to change the memory layout in the shared memory, and then you would need to know how do I need to rearrange the elements so it, it fits the other mapping that's used in the shared memory. But like having a primitive, like I would think like, like an algorithm that says like for each thingy in my local piece, cache and then run the computation. I think that's a primitive that would sit on top of Llama, and I think it's not part of the library. Okay. Uh, can I jump in? I absolutely agree with uh, what, what you said. 
because uh, one example why you can't put it into Llama is that if you look, for example, to the uh, NVIDIA GPUs, you have now in the new A100 operation, which is saying uh, cache uh, uh, memory from global memory to the shared memory asynchronous. And something like that, Llama can't know. And mm -hmm. only the specific library, library which is handling the, the different languages, for example, Alpaca, can know about this operation and then can describe how to use this operation. And as uh, Bernard already said, uh, you can define what is the layout later on in the shared memory. And then you, you perform a, a dot-wise operation on, on, on that memory with one thread or multiple threads. You need to decide it because this is then architecture specific. Also the layout in the shared memory is architecture specific, but you can explicitly say, design, uh, layout my memory uh, uh, row wise or layout it column wise or something like that. So you as library alpaca, for example, know what you like to have and you need only to express it to Llama. So Llama is agnostic about uh, how you later on copy it or something. Yes. Okay. Any more questions? And thank you, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry that it was boring to one of you. Just kidding. I, 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 saw, I saw two people fall asleep. I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, thanks for being here and uh, have a nice lunchtime. Thank you.